Hello, Bakery Econ students. Congratulations. You're already halfway done with the course, so happy Easter weekend to everyone. Uh, this week we have two chapters, chapter 27 and 28. Uh, this is some of my favorite subjects dealing with money and the Federal Reserve, so I think you will enjoy reading it. If you've been paying attention to the news, the Fed has decided to kind of leave interest rates unchanged for now, so that's Good. And what they do is they, they target the Fed funds rate. They don't necessarily say that banks, you have to charge this rate. What they do is they control the money supply, which impacts the, that rate. And that's uh, what you're going to read about a lot this week about how they do it. And it's going to deal a little bit with theory and some of the graphs. So just to start off with the first chapter, chapter 27, you're going to go through some definitions of, you know, what constitutes money. It has to be a medium exchange, a unit of count, and a store of value. So if you think about those three, a medium exchange, everybody else has to accept it as a form of payment. So we're used to the cash and the checking account, but there's a lot of different ways that we pay with things today. And some of them are electronic, too. So it's definitely changed the landscape of how we do things today. If you also think about uh, in terms of a unit of account, uh, well, we know what a dollar should buy and what $10 should buy and a $50 bill should buy. So it's, it's a measurement. We can make comparisons between goods and services. Finally, the store of value. If I take this dollar and I shove it up in my mattress, well, I should expect that a year from now I'll be able to go out and pull that dollar out and still be able to use it. Now, I may not have as much value because of inflation, but it does have a store of value. What is interesting, if you look at credit cards, they're highly used today. Uh, I use it pretty much to pay for everything, just to get the uh, rewards kicked back. I just take the cash. Uh, once it reaches a certain threshold, I can cash it in. But you could say, yeah, it definitely meets the meaning of exchange. A lot of places take it. Uh, unit of account, I get a bank statement that tells me what I spent. But the store of value, you got to remember that a credit card is just a um, extended credit. It's just somebody, it's, a, you know, it's like you're creating a liability. And a bank can take it away at any time. So uh, that, that would be the shortfall of credit card as definition of money. So some other things you're going to do in Chapter 27 is you're going to uh, look at the types of financial institutions. I used to work in banking, but I'll tell you one thing, that the banking industry is definitely consolidating more compared to what we used to have. is probably over 20,000 financial institutions. Uh, the majority of them today are commercial banks and credit unions, but there are other types. But... A lot of that uh, consolidation was due to changes in the allowance to bank across state lines. It used to be that you could not do that. And also banks just recognizing economies of scale, that what we talked about before, that if I can merge things together, I can do it at a lower average total cost so I can experience economies of scale. And especially today when you're trying to offer technology and trying to do it at the lowest cost, try to do it as a small bank, uh, it's really hard to do. So you're also going to look at the structure of the Fed. Uh, if you get a chance, look up 10 Magazine from the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, Esther George. Uh, she's our local Federal Reserve president. And she's quite a success story. She uh, started off at a low-level position at the bank. She's from Fawcett, Missouri, and worked all the way up uh, to uh, the president of the Fed. So she is on that Federal Remark Committee on a rotating basis and makes decisions about our economy. So that's quite impressive. So. But you're going to look at those uh, roles of the Fed. Uh, the primary ways and tools that can change the money supply is through the discount rate, which is the rate that the Federal Reserve charges member banks. It can also be through reserve requirements, which you're going to learn a little, a little bit more about that in the next chapter um, about the money multiplier process. Uh, basically, if you increase the reserve requirement, that's less money the banks can lend out and less growth of the money supply. But if you lower it, uh, you could actually increase the money supply. But the Fed does not really play around with the discount rate or the reserve requirements. Those days, things pretty much the same. It's the open market operations. That's the buying and selling of bonds on a daily basis. So if you think of it this way, if I am the Federal Reserve and you all are the open market, the public, if I sell bonds to you, I'm taking, I'm asking for your money. So I'm taking that money out of the economy. And by taking the money out, there's less of a supply of it. It gets smaller, and that makes the interest rates go up because the interest rate is the price you pay for it. So the same thing is the opposite. If I'm the Fed and I buy the bonds uh, from you, I'm giving you cash. And as I pump up that cash in the economy, the cash supply grows, just like the law of supply and demand. And if there's a lot of something out there, the price is going to fall. And if there's a lot of money out there, the price we pay for it in the form of interest rate is going to fall too. So... Uh, hopefully that explanation helps a little bit and you're thinking about how this works. 
Chapter 28 deals with the demand for money. Uh, you're going to look at the idea of like interest rates and the opportunity cost, you know, the idea of a nominal rate. If the opportunity cost is high and there are good real, not good real rates that I can make it a, a decent return on right now, rates are still not that great for short term. Uh, you know, about 2% is the best you can do on a money market, but it's saying that yeah, I'd rather keep my money in the bank because I'm going to get a return on it. I can buy more in the future with it or do more in the future, but when the uh, rates are lower, I'll hold on to um, hold on to more money, and you'll see like these shifts in the money supply, meaning that the money supply is perfectly inelastic. And as that change happens, you know, as they do uh, through the Federal Reserve, people are going to shift the amount of money that they hold. So that a lot of that chapter has to deal with that. And just kind of as a side too, I want you to understand that uh, bond prices and interest rates have an inverse relationship. So. If you have something that pay is a thousand dollar bond, it pays a coupon of five percent of fifty dollars. Well, if everybody wants that bond, it's going to push up that price of that bond, say to a thousand seventy dollars. But you're still just getting that same fifty dollars, so your rate of return is going down. But that's a lot of times what we see in the bond markets. It's just people jump back and forth between the stock market and the bond market. Uh, the stock market is doing quite well right now, and if all of a sudden it starts going bad. People are probably going to jump to somewhere safe and they're going to start buying bonds, which push up their prices, but also makes the uh, rate of their returns go down because you get that faint, same fixed coupon payment every six months. So uh, just a little bit more, just discuss, um, you'll deal with the quantity theory money, uh, MV equals PQ. Basically, it's saying that if we're already at a certain level of output in the economy and velocity is constant, any increases in money are just going to bring about changes in the price level, higher level prices. So it's just, you know, if you're at full employment, which we pretty much are now at 3.8% un unemployment, uh, any increase in the money supply is just going to push up prices. So uh, just an interesting aside, if you ever get a chance, uh, look up The Wizard of Oz and monetary policy. Uh, there are many believe that Frank L. Baum, when he wrote the book in 1896, was really telling the story about monetary policy. So you can think about some things in the book because they were talking about a bimetallic standard at that, that time period, about whether they should go with a gold standard or the silver standard. Well, think about it. Follow the yellow brick road, uh, back to the gold standard. But in the movie, um, with the actress, they had her red, wear red ruby shoes. But in the book, she's actually wearing silver shoes. So uh, if you get a chance to search the web, I think you'll find it a little bit interesting uh, if you believe that it was really a story about monetary policy. So... And uh, just kind of they wrap up the last chapter, again, as we mentioned already, was just the cost of inflation. So it's something, you know, that the Fed is concerned about. Uh, they obviously try to juggle, I say, the three main balls of GDP growth, unemployment and inflation, and, you know, try to keep a stable economy. So we, we are concerned about inflation because it does have wealth effects. So uh, that is that if I um, only get a raise of 2% or I don't get a raise of all and prices go up, I'm actually, my standard of living is I'm much worse off. So... All right, well, that's it for this week. Have a great Easter. Uh, great job online, everyone, with the forum discussion post. I really appreciate that. You know, jump in there early. Again, I, I may not be able to get to everybody, but I try to get to a lot of uh, people on their post uh, to make a comment. And, uh, again, just keep plugging along. we got three more weeks, so I will uh, talk to you online. Take care.